keeping with one of the oldest traditions in military service, pay special tribute to the director, Department of Defense Special Access Program Central Office, Major General Abba, on the occasion of his retirement. The presiding official for today's ceremony is retired General Mike Holmes, the former commander, Air Combat Command, Joint Base Langley Eustis, Virginia. We're also honored to have as a guest speaker, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Kathleen Hicks. Please rise for the arrival of the official party and the playing of musical honors, followed by the presentation of colors and the playing of our national anthem. In honor of Major General Abba's retirement, General Holmes has deferred military honors. Therefore, two ruffles and flourishes will be played to signify Major General Abba's two stars.
Please remain standing for the invocation given by Colonel John Barkmeyer. And let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the 29 years of dedicated and selfless service offered by Major General David Abba on behalf of our country. As we acknowledge the skills, the expertise, and the commitment he has displayed, may we be encouraged to pursue such excellence in our own lives. We also recognize the sacrifice on behalf of his family, which has made his service possible. Guide David as he begins this new chapter in life. May he always know that you are with him each and every day. Bless him and his family as they transition into a new life of service. May they bring you honor and glory in all that they do. We make this prayer in your holy name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. It is our distinct pleasure to welcome the members of, the, of General Abba's family present at, the, at today's ceremony, his wife, Mrs. Carla Abba, his father, Wayne Abba, his daughters, Naya, Serena, Lauren, and Lonnie, and his son, Jack. It is also our pleasure to welcome the distinguished guests present at today's ceremonies. The honorary, uh, Honorable Cara Albuquerque, the Honorable Matt Donovan, the Honorable Carolyn Crass, the Honorable Melancy Harris, the Honorable Jennifer Walsh, the Honorable Robert Karam, the Honorable Peter Verga, Lieutenant General Dan Kane, and Lieutenant General Stephen Davis. The Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Kathleen Hicks, will now provide remarks on Major General Abba's career. Well, good morning, everyone, and what a bittersweet uh, but mostly really happy uh, moment to be gathered here to honor General Abba's career in the U.S. Air Force and his lifelong dedication to public service. Let me join in thanking um, the family, um, his wife Carla, children Naya, Jack, Serena, Lauren, and Lonnie. To all of you, welcome to the Pentagon. Public service runs deep in the Abba family. Notably, Deke's parents, mother, father, and stepfather were all career DOD civil servants. Deke's father, Mr. Wayne Abba, who is here with us today, served for 17 years in the office of the Secretary of Defense, focusing on acquisition. So Deke, in many ways, these past several years must have felt a little bit like a homecoming for you. Thank you to each of you for your service, for inspiring Deke to serve and supporting him throughout the decades. I'd also like to acknowledge all of General Abba's extended family, friends, and teammates who are joining us today, and the senior DOD leaders who have taken time out of their busy schedules to wish him a much-deserved retirement. Since at least World War II, the Department of Defense has made a concerted effort to protect its sprawling defense information ecosystem. It's an effort critical for maintaining decision advantage over our strategic competitors. In DOD, we work hard to maintain that advantage every day. Our military special access programs, otherwise known as SAPs, are essential to that goal. SAPs are where those extraordinary innovations that make our military the best in the world often originate, including cutting-edge stealth capabilities that protect and enable the B-2, the F-22, and the F-35, each of which Deke is deeply familiar with. 
And the SAP Central Office, or SAPCO, which Deke has led for the past three years, is charged with safeguarding those crown jewels of our military. Before becoming SAPCO director, Deke was the director of the F-35 Integration Office, with the F-35, of course, being one of the largest and most complex defense acquisition programs in history. And before that, Deke had logged thousands of flight hours in advanced aircraft, including the F-22 and the B-2. So by the time I selected Deke to be the SAPCO director, he was uniquely positioned to succeed in the role. He had all the right stuff to take off on day one. As someone who's sat in those cockpits, he knows more than most how important it is that our warfighters have the most coveted technologies and capabilities protected. In fact, the department takes extraordinary steps to protect those crown jewels. That imperative has required Deke to be an omnipresent force in the innovation process, from the idea phase when a piece of innovation is just a gleam in the eye of a scientist or engineer, all the way to the delivery of the capability downrange and every phase in between. He asks the tough but vital questions like, is it real? Is it viable? Do we need it? How do we use it? How do we pay for it? And so on. And he's ensuring a traceable record of those answers. Now, like any long-standing program, especially one of such importance over time, the SAP enterprise required a much-needed overhaul. The old ways of doing things were no longer working, no longer serving our national interests, and we had to shift gears. It was clear that the department needed to adopt a more agile process to protect our most valuable technology assets and meet the demands of today's dynamic joint operating environment. Undertaking such a tremendous effort required someone at the top who had the leadership chops to drive change, someone who could craft an approach fitted to those rapidly evolving demands of today's world, someone who could bring a new way of thinking who possessed imagination geared to expanding the bounds of what had been to explore what is possible. But a starry-eyed dreamer was not going to get the job done. The reform project also required someone who could bring the right technical expertise and organizational savvy to the process. Fortunately for me, for us, we had Digaba. Deke brought enthusiasm to this daunting work, along with the measured, thoughtful, and collaborative approach we needed. And he proved to be tremendously effective at getting the job done. It wasn't easy. It required working across the military services, each with its own way of doing things, own opinions, and own priorities, to find an optimal path that supports our joint and mission-focused approach to military operations. So Deke used all the tools at his disposable, uh, disposal to influence progress and advance this mission. Under Deke's leadership, the department's security enterprise created a new and secure framework that increases information flow, improves collaboration, and enables greater, more rapid innovation. Of course, we can't get into the nuts and bolts of all that Deke has done to accomplish this feat. It's quiet work, it's cerebral and strategic work, it's hard work. It's work that Deke was perfectly suited for and excited to do. But all of us can rest assured that in his doing that tireless work, he has kept every person in this room and beyond much safer. Deke, it is difficult to overstate the generational impact that you've accomplished over the past three years leading SAPCO. Suffice it to say, what you've done in terms of reform will influence the way the department operates for decades to come. I gave you a massive task, and you met and exceeded the bar, and you were truly a pleasure to work with, and I'm deeply grateful to you. So I'd say that after all you've achieved here, after nearly three decades of military service, including 17 moves, four deployments, 12 tours, you and your family are due for this well-deserved retirement. I especially applaud your wisdom to take a few months to just regain your breath. And as you exhale, be confident that you have strengthened our defense through your service. I know I join absolutely everyone here in congratulating you on a job well done and for reaching this milestone in an impressive and esteemed career. I wish you and your family all the best 
as you begin this next phase of your lives. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as the Honorable Kathleen Hicks presents Major General Abba with the Defense Distinguished Service Medal. Oh, sure. Citation to accompany the award of Defense Distinguished Service Medal to David W. Abba. Major General David W. Abba, United States Air Force, distinguished himself by exceptionally distinguished service as Director, Department of Defense Special Access Program, Central Office, District of Columbia, from 30 August 2021 to 1 November 2024. During this period, General Abba's exceptional leadership produced a profound and positive impact on Special Access Program support to the entire department, other government agencies, and the Joint Force. His unique leadership and ability to bring multiple diverse stakeholders together drove multiple game-changing reform efforts to greatly improve the special access program enterprise, enable the warfighter, and streamline the processes and procedures that support and protect our nation's most sensitive capabilities. A mentor, coach, and highly effective leader, he achieved profound results while building a culture of excellence, collaboration, and positivity setting the conditions for continued success of the Special Access Program enterprise for years to come. The distinctive accomplishments of Major General Abba culminate a distinguished career in the service of his country and reflect great credit upon himself, the United States Air Force, and the Department of Defense. Please be seated. General Holmes will now provide remarks on Major General Abbott's career. It's hard to follow that, but tradition says that I have to, so uh, I'm extremely happy to be here with you uh, today uh, to be a part of this big day for the Abbott's. Uh, it's great to see so many old friends, and it reminds me of how glad I am to be back with you and of the larger community of the people that serve to protect our nation. And I know you're going to come for me, so be thank you. <laughs> to see all these old friends and be with them a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about Dave's career, which is traditional what we do. You kind of saw where it ended up, so there's not much suspense in the story I'm going to tell. Uh, he ended up with the full trust and confidence of the Deputy Secretary of Defense of the United States of America, which is saying a lot. Uh, but we'll step back a little bit, and I'm going to talk about Deke as a pilot, as an officer, as a strategist, you know, as an innovator. But before I do, I also want to say, you know, he's a pretty good dad, too. And we should take a minute and think about that. But I'm going to start with that because, really, when you think about this amazing family that the Abbas have, it really represents all that we hold dear in military families and American families. Uh, the superpower here is really Carl, so I want to take this opportunity to thank you for bringing your superpowers to bear uh, to build this family and, and raise these kids and letting us all be a part of it. My wife Sarah is all, also here with us and she wants to thank you today for forcing me to get her kind of shade. <laughs> point of you know information for you retirees I've learned that the shelf life on the APIS spiny's AP spinous uniform shoes 
is about three and a half years. I've had two retirements, and both my A shoes and my B shoes have blown out. <laughs> <laughs> I try to do it. So about three years in the closet, and you got to go get a new pair. <laughs> if you guys approach your retirement. Okay. Uh, I hope you'll take some time to enjoy this. I hope you'll take some time to enjoy uh, your association with the Abbas as we talk through it. I'll try to be at least 10% true on the stories that I tell, and you'll have your chance this afternoon over at the Crystal City Sports Club to add, to add your versions into it. But, you know, Lieutenant Abba, Major General uh, Abba, uh, we're here in Northern Virginia. My story, at least as I understand it, you know, starts out here being raised as a kid with a dad who worked here in the Pentagon. Uh, he was going to high school here. He competed and was accepted into Thomas Jefferson High School, one of the hardest high schools to be accepted to in the United States. He'll tell you it was easier then, maybe, but it wasn't easy then, which got him into the U.S. Air Force Academy again, one of the hardest universities to be accepted to in the United States. At the Air Force Academy, he excelled as a student. He was selected to go to pilot training, and they liked him well enough to get him to stick around in the year he was waiting to go to pilot training to work in the athletic department and help coach the women's soccer team, where he started unveiling his talent for kind of automating and digitizing processes before any of us ever really thought about that. I was reading the OPR says he digitized the recruiting process and automated a lot of things that were doing there. I'm guessing it was one of those old computers. You know, <laughs> that we carried into weapon shops, you know, a long time ago, but yeah. But he demonstrated his talent for that. He was off the pilot training in advance where he went through the program we had where we were jointly doing it with the Navy, including the T-34 and not the T-37, and then the T-38. He was a distinguished graduate of the pilot training, which got him into the mighty F-15. So off the Tyndall to the FTU there, where he again excelled, and he found his way to Langley Air Force Base and the 1st Fighter Wing and the 71st Fighter Squadron. Iron, I'll uh, say it. Uh, <laughs> I say Iron for the for the Iron Men, Iron. Iron in the room, and that's where that's where I met uh, Lieutenant Abbott at the time. And you know, I saw myself as that kind of fatherly old ops officer who was going to help people grow. You know, beyond being pilots and excellent pilot, great results coming out of FTU. I had a little project. I brought Lieutenant Abbott and I said, Hey, I've got to write a letter to so and so. You know, I'd like you to take a hack at it, and then we'll sit down and work at it. I gave it to him, and, you know, he brought it back to me, and I got my pencil out, and I'm ready to teach him something here. Edit this thing, and I look at it. I look at it again, and I try to find something wrong with it, <laughs> and I can't. So I put my pencil down, and got my pen, and signed it, and learned something about working with Lieutenant Abba, uh, of what not to, not to take for granted. But in Langley, he excelled. He went through all the upgrades. He deployed to combat with us, did a super job. Uh, he was a very uh, innovative uh, thinker. We were the first squadron to get everybody 100% CMR to deploy. And our training officer you know, got us to shoot the pistol when we were TDY at other bases and things like that to try to get us, help us get all that done. Worked his way up through there to the OSS and then was selected to go to Tyndall. Uh, to be an instructor pilot back in that F-15 flying training unit. Breezed through that course, excelled uh, back in the operational support squadron where he's kind of leading the wings programs, the lead academic instructor, and after several years of nominations, was selected to go attend the fighter weapon school course at Nellis, where again, he did very well, and the training report says we'd love to have him come back and teach, which is kind of the highest uh, accolade that they give when you go through that course. I think he went back to Tendall for a little bit, but I know shortly after that, after being the wing weapons officer there, you were off to the 33rd wing at Eglin, I think the Gorillas, and then the 33rd OSS. And now is the time that you start to see OPRs, and instead of being signed by a flight commander and an ops officer, are signed by the ops group commander or the wing commander that say, this is my best pilot in the wing, and this is my best officer uh, in the wing. And as a squadron weapons officer, he's responsible for making sure that every air crew member, every pilot in that squadron is prepared and ready for combat. And then as he moved up to be the wing weapons officer, he's responsible for making sure that new weapon systems are properly integrated, that new tactics are properly developed, and that he's thinking up a level. He's thinking up beyond that tactical level. So super job there. At the end of that tour at Eglin, he basically is a fully qualified fighter pilot. He's done all the things that you can do 
and he's already showing the signs of thinking beyond that. He's thinking past tactics to strategy about how to employ things, and he's thinking about the future of the weapon system, what needs to be included in it, and how we use that in the future. He selected to go uh, do a year of education with the Navy up in Newport in the junior version of Naval War College. A great place to be to get the opportunity to go do that. Once again, he excelled there as a distinguished graduate, and he stuck around again doing something a little bit extra for their advanced studies program, their counterpart to SAMS and SAS that the Army and the Air Force have to again think strategy and start thinking beyond. Uh, he was selected then to come back here to the Pentagon and be a part of the Chief's new strategic studies group. The CNO had a strategic studies group. The Chief thought he should have one too. And so we created one and then the initial cadre uh, was uh, now Major Abba and a bunch of other really capable people. In his time there, he was able to make such a strong impression on the chief that he moved it across the glass doors and became the junior exec to the chief. And so what he's doing now is he's learning not just flying airplanes, not just ops and maintenance, but how does the Air Force fit into the overall defense establishment and what are the issues that come across the plate to the chief and the secretary? And how can you help them think about it by helping write for them, helping build briefings for them, and help them prepare for the meetings with the help represent exceptional job there which got him selected uh, for lieutenant colonel and then back to the first wing which is now transitioned to the f-22 so uh, you know if you were flying f-15s in that era that we grew up in you were really hoping to make your way into the f-22 some people got the chance to do it some people became other things and he got a chance to go do it into the 27th after finishing the checkout program where as the opso he took the first f-22 deployment to the middle east uh, Start to think about all the SAP programs and working those in all the different places and how we work that through the deployment. And as a squadron commander, he, he did that again, and he was a part of a squadron in those that time there that was selected as the best squadron, uh, best air air squadron in the Air Force. So uh, again, excelled this time at learning to lead those squadrons. He had been a captain and a major in, and as a reward, he was selected to come back to DC to the Eisenhower School to again to one of our premier. Uh, educational uh, opportunities where he was again a distinguished graduate after being a distinguished graduate of the Navy's uh, War College and of our Squadron Officer School while he was at Tyndall. And the, you know, the, the job he did there, I'll try to think through the process here and see if I get this all right. Is it off to Alaska then out of there or is there something else in between that? Policy. Yep, so back, thank you. Back to OSD policy where again I ran into him. So his first exposure now to OSD policy, again he knows how we fight. He's had a year at the Eisenhower School to think about how you build the military for the future. So he's off to strategy and force planning I think. And I was in the A8 office here and so his boss and I sat across the table at many meetings. I could tell which ones Deke had done the prep for. <laughs> and we were uh, working through that. Uh, and he was the go-to guy for air strategy. He was the go-to guy to go play in war games. And again, he's moving beyond tactics into strategy and starting the process of moving beyond force on force to thinking about competition and deterrence and how do you avoid a war and how do you think deeply about how to win one if you have to go fight. So from there, uh, now he's selected for Colonel and he's off to Alaska to be the ops group commander there back in the F-22 able to teach what he learned about how to generate combat power in the F-22 and how to deploy it around the Pacific to squadron commanders. After being the top squadron commander multiple times, he's now the top group commander and weighing the top ops group commander in PACAP, and he's selected to come back to Air Combat Command and be the 53rd Operational Test Wing Commander. A very unique organization. Multiple detachments, what, 25, 30, something like that, you can remember exactly. 74 units and 25 locations. There you go. <laughs> 25, I knew was in there somewhere. So what they're doing now is when we, we develop a system in the U.S. military, we write requirements for it, it goes through an acquisition process, it goes into the developmental test world where they, they kind of see if it meets the individual requirements, and then they hand it to the 53rd operational test wing to see if it works as a weapon see where the shortfalls are, to see if it works with everything that it has to work with, and whether it'll, it'll provide effects for warfighters. So it's across everything that the Air Force operates, spread across the country in 25 uh, installations, 
a great opportunity to learn leadership beyond the people that are in the room with you and to start to understand what you learned about material in the Eisenhower School and how you test that and actually turn it into a weapon. Selected for Brigadier General and then came here to the Pentagon to be the F-35 Integration Office Lead. Uh, a great young airplane going through all the growing pains that great young airplanes go through. A lot of interaction in the building, a lot of interaction on the hill, a lot of interaction with the industry to try to help take that great airplane and, and fully realize the capabilities that it provides to warfighters. And a lot of work to kind of foresee what the issues are going to be, prepare people for them so they're not surprised, and work solutions for the issues that are coming down the road. Uh, in his proximity here in the building, and because of his time, I think, in the strategic studies group and the relationships he was built, he was chosen to be kind of the lead of the transition program between chiefs. So when General Brown was coming in to be the next chief and thinking about how he wanted to communicate what he cared about, he was a key part of that, worked back and forth. You know, there were three deliverables that he delivered and lots of products that came out. He had his hand in all those and trying to think about uh, the future. And then finally, as DST Hicks said, there's no person in the earth now better prepared to come across and take on the SAPCO duties and all the challenges uh, that we face there. So certainly a great pilot. Everything you're supposed to do excelled in the F-15 and the F-22. Certainly a great leader of Air Force units at the squadron, at the operations group, at the wing level, here in the Pentagon. But it was always, Dave was always, there's the part you see above the waterline, and there's the part that was going on below the waterline, out of sight, with relationships that he had built, the friends that he had made, trying to advance the art, trying to get ahead of problems, and to try to you know, digitize and automate processes, and to have a real early focus on the challenges posed by the People's Republic of China that we widely recognize as our biggest challenge now. Uh, Dave is probably a little ahead of some of the rest of us on figuring that out and working behind the scenes to build solutions here. So uh, Dave, Dave, it's been a tremendous career. I'm extremely proud of all you have accomplished uh, with the most important part of Carrie with you sitting down here in the front row. I look forward to the opportunities that you'll have to further the work that you've done outside of uniform, and they're there, and you'll get lots of them, and you'll have a chance to continue to contribute to the work that, that we do and to get the tools that warfighters need into their hands. So we're a little out of order now because the award presentation has been submitted. I'm hoping that the narrator will rescue me, and I think we'll start handing out plaques and doing things as we proceed to our retirement. I got you covered, sir. Please rise as General Holm retires Major General Abba. Attention to orders. Department of the Air Force, Washington, District of Columbia, Special Order Alpha Charlie Gulf 049, by order of the Secretary of the Air Force, Major General David W. Abba is retired from the United States Air Force, effective 31 October 2024, after more than 29 years of faithful and honorable duty. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. No. I got some more hands. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Major General Abba, we are pleased to present you with the following certificate of appreciation from our Commander in Chief. It reads I extend my personal gratitude and the sincere appreciation of a grateful nation 
to you for your patriotic service to our country. Your bravery and dedication in our armed forces help to protect your fellow Americans during a critical moment in our history and contributed to a world of greater security and growing prosperity. Your devotion to duty, honor, and country, in keeping with the long traditions of the finest military in the world, embody the American ideal of selfless service. Our nation owes you an incredible debt. Your commitment and the example you set will inspire future generations to serve with pride and keep our country secure. You re represent the best of our nation, and I join our fellow Americans in saluting your honorable service. I wish you happiness and success in your next chapter. Signed, Joseph R. Biden, Jr. <laughs> Mrs. Carla Abba will now join General Holmes in presenting Major General Abba with the Air Force retirement pin. General Holmes will now present Mrs. Abba with a certificate of appreciation from the United States Air Force. It reads, in grateful appreciation, the United States Air Force presents this certificate of recognition to Carla Abba for the commitment and numerous contributions that made positive impacts to the nation's defense. Thank you for the support which gave strength and purpose to your spouse's service. Signed, General David Alvin. United States Air Force Chief of Staff. Thank you, General Holmes. Major General Abba will now be presented with a special gift from the DOD SAPCO team. Anyone else who wishes to present Major General Abba with a gift is invited to do so after the ceremony or at the reception later this afternoon. It's become a tradition in the DOD Special Access Program Central Office to present the Black Globe to departing members of the office. General, this is a reminder of the secrets that we protected on behalf of the Joint Force and our nation. Thank you for your service. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present Major General David Abba, United States Air Force, retired. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> I'm grateful that you all chose to spend your time with my family and me today, especially braving the weather. I'm going to go slightly off script for a second. Um, I don't know what it is about me and ceremonies, uh, but when I made the lieutenant colonel, the morning of my promotion was Snowmageddon in March of 2009. Um, the first night in command at the 53rd wing. We got no sleep because it was tornado warning after tornado warning all last night, and then whatever the hell this was uh, with the remnants of, uh, of Debbie. Uh, but I am going to do something highly unusual for me um, in today, and that's speak from a script. Uh, if I wing it, uh, who knows how long we'll be here, uh, and there's a number of things that I want to say that with a degree of precision that I can only get uh, by, by writing it all down beforehand. First, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who made this ceremony happen. These events only look easy because of the hard work beforehand and behind the scenes. So to Brandon and Sheila and Will, Tori, Bruce, the protocol team, and the deputies front office, 
Thanks for making this a special day for me and my family. My team's put on two retirement ceremonies in two months. That's a huge lift, but you made it look easy without skipping a beat uh, in your day jobs. I want to also thank the Honor Guard, the band, and the chaplain for uh, helping us mark this moment with professionalism and dignity. Um, I'm honored. General Holmes, we're, uh, they're sneaking around on me there, sir. <clears throat> Thanks for officiating and for your kind words. Uh, our time in the Ironman, Iron. Iron, 25 years ago, set me on the right path. Before I get too sentimental today, I have to share one funny story about then Lieutenant Colonel Mobile. Uh, we're deployed to Saudi in 98, and an email comes out looking for F-15 demo team narrators. I don't know if you remember this. Then Lieutenant Colonel Holmes was not remotely amused by my interest in, the, in being a demo team narrator. And I'll never forget him angrily summoning me into his office, asking me, do you want to go to weapon school or do you want to have fun for a summer? <laughs> and my answer, which foreshadowed countless future tough conversations we've had over the year, was I want to do both. <laughs> so thanks for putting up with my act and for all your leadership, mentorship, and friendship over the years. Having you and Sarah here today uh, is perfect. And while she had to leave to attend to far more important things, I want to thank Deputy Secretary Hicks for carving time out of her PAC schedule to participate. But more importantly, I want to thank her publicly for her leadership over the last three years. She's an exceptional boss, and we couldn't have accomplished anything that we did as a SAP community without her direct personal engagement and drive. I also really deeply appreciate her leadership style. When we'd meet monthly, we'd agreed about what my objectives were for the next month, and then she just held me ruthlessly accountable. But without losing her remarkable sense of humor and empathy and compassion for the people in the trenches actually doing the work. She's an exceptional Deputy Secretary of Defense, and I'm grateful to have worked for her. 12,097 days. That's how many days have passed since I arrived at the Air Force Academy on June 27, 1991. 12,097. Soup and others in the room, they're with us. Realize I've now been in the Air Force twice as long as I'd been alive when I showed up at the Academy. As an adult, I've never known anything but this life, and I'll for be forever grateful for what the Air Force has taught me and given me over the years. I wouldn't change a single thing in my career. Even if I could, I wouldn't go back and relive any of the highest highs or ask for a mulligan for any of the bad days that I've had. Each experience shaped me into who I am today. I'm deeply proud of what I've accomplished alongside friends, family, and coworkers. And as I reflect back on my career, there's three themes that I wanna talk about today. Memories, regrets, and gratitude. I'll start first with the memories, and thanks General Holmes for giving us the chronology. I'm not gonna relive the chronology, but I'm gonna hit a couple of the highlights along the, uh, along the way. I remember showing up at the academy with absolutely no idea what I was really getting myself into. I had no concept that the friends I made there would be lifelong friends. Several are here today in person and others along on the live stream. I couldn't have survived that experience without you and I'm grateful for all the other memories we've created over the last 30 plus years. I remember my excitement about being selected for pilot training, all the stress and the hard work that led to flying F-15s, the sound of a JFS start before dawn and a BFM surge, ocean crossings, the feeling that's indescribable when you first fly into another country, knowing that there's people there that want to kill you. Teaching our young pilots our craft and watching them grow up to be tremendous leaders. Spending the best and the hardest six months of my life at the weapons school. I don't remember who told me this, but they were absolutely right. You spend your whole life trying to get there, six months trying to get out, in the rest of your life trying to get back. The really bizarre feeling of flying live loaded jets over your own country after 9-11. Never forgot how weird that felt. Chasing President Bush all around the country during the 2004 election and many, many more cycles with the Homeland Defense Mission in the Eagle and in the Raptor. Being fortunate to command the 94th Fighter Squadron on its 94th birthday Amen, Marianne. Feeling the weight of that squadron's legacy and hoping to live up to its historical expectations. Introducing the F-22 to the Middle East and being immensely proud when follow-on squadrons ultimately began flying um, combat ops from that same deployed location. 
being grounded for five months while we sorted out a pesky little situation with the oxygen system. And I can assure you, you have never lived until you've had Leslie Stahl in the 60 Minutes team in your main briefing room. <laughs> Remember the serenity of flying in Alaska, the awesome responsibility of commanding a wing like the 53rd, where I had the opportunity to fly just damn near everything in the Air Force inventory. It was like a kid in a candy store. I've been unbelievably blessed in my flying career and have enough memories to last a lifetime. I began this journey expecting to do nothing but fly. The me of 12,000 days ago would be super surprised and probably highly horrified to hear me say that some of my most memorable Air Force experience have nothing to do with flying jets. I've been joking with folks recently that I'm a lot like Forrest Gump when it comes to things outside of the cockpit. I'm never the main character, but you'll see me in the background of a lot of pictures from times and events that shaped the Air Force and the Department of Defense. Leading change is hard, and I've been fortunate to do a lot of that over the last few years. I was honored that General Brown asked me to serve as his transition officer in 2020 and to have had a small hand along with Krista writing Accelerate Change or Lose in the action orders. The lessons I learned from that experience shaped what we aim to achieve in SAPCO. SAP Enterprise Reform, ACCM Reform, and a host of other supporting efforts all benefited from that experience. Springs to mind one of my favorite quotes from Machiavelli in The Prince. There is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. For the innovator has enemies in all those who would profit by the old order, in only lukewarm defenders and all those who would profit by the new order. This lukewarmness arising partly from fear of their adversaries and partly from the incredulity of mankind who do not truly believe in anything new until they have had actual experience of it. Some people are motivated by optimistic visions of the future. Over many years, I've learned that I am, more often than not, motivated by fear. Fear of not doing enough and fear of not doing it well enough. I've long been haunted by former Air Force or Army Chief uh, General Eric Shinseki's quote, if you don't like change, you like irrelevance even less. While I said that I wouldn't change a single thing in my career, it doesn't mean that I don't have regrets. And I hope those of you who continue to serve can take in a lesser or two from mine, except for the first one because you can't relive this. I regret not taking better advantage of all the opportunities the Air Force Academy afforded me. Uh, I was in survival mode, and I was too immature to realize all the opportunities I was leaving on the table. I regret not creating and spending more quality time with friends that I eventually lost due to combat, mishaps, or illness. I regret not giving more when I had more to give, and there were certainly times when I could have done so. But conversely, I regret giving more than I had to give at several points in my career. I almost ran myself into the ground in wing command, while I realized it late, I'm grateful that I caught it when I did. I regret not having the courage to push harder when I knew I was right about issues that would have had a meaningful impact on the mission or would benefit our airmen. It's hard knowing today that I could have done more. I regret not leaving work at work more often. I've gotten better at it in recent years, and while I was fortunate that I didn't miss anywhere near as many holidays and special events as many of my peers, I regret that I wasn't more present at the times when I was home. I don't remember today what I was working on, what was so important, but my family's all here. The inverse of regret is gratitude, which is my final theme. Gratitude for the opportunities I've had, the challenges that have helped me grow, and for the people I've had the honor to serve with. To my mentors, peers, and those I've had the privilege to lead, thank you. You've made this journey not just rewarding, but truly unforgettable. And while I don't have time to thank everyone individually, I do want to say thank you to several different groups of people. I'll start with our senior leadership in the room, military and civilian, for your leadership and teamwork over the last three years. We've been on quite the journey, Loclo XCOM, STAOX, ACCM review, SAP reform, anomalous health incidents, Sean, UAPs, <laughs> working a bunch of really challenging issues that we mostly can't talk about today. You all tolerated me pushing you hard, and you helped us shape countless tough decisions for the Deputy Secretary and the Secretary. And I retire knowing the nation and our allies and partners are safer because of the hard work you do every day. We couldn't have accomplished any of the things we have in the last few years without the whole SAP community buying into the notion that while this would be incredibly difficult, we didn't have a choice. The status quo risk exceeded the risk of trying something new and maybe not getting it exactly right right out of the gate. 
to our SAP community colleagues who are here, teammates across government, including on the Hill, in industry, you and the amazing team in DOD SAPCO will never get the appreciation and the accolades you deserve. No one will understand fully what you've been through or just how hard this has been. Thanks for all you've done, all you will do, and for your leadership, teamwork, and friendship. I'll never forget, and I'll miss you all. My entire career trajectory was shaped by strong leaders, like this one, who were willing to tell me no to things I wanted in the short term in favor of long-term payoffs, especially early on. I'm deeply grateful to everyone who took an interest and saw potential in me, despite me sometimes begging to go in a different direction. When I look back at the beginning of my career in particular, I didn't realize at the time just how fortunate I was to be surrounded by such an amazing group of leaders. When exceptional is the standard, as it was in the first fighter wing when I was a lieutenant, it's natural to just want to work hard in order to just keep up. Those who know me well know that I'm truly an introvert at heart. I can be social, but it's emotionally draining. I've relied upon a very small group, close of friend, a small group of close friends since the early 1990s. You guys know who you are, either here in the room or online. Thanks for always being there for me every time I pick up the phone to call or text. In good times and bad, I know I can count on you. I'm thankful for everyone I served with over the last three decades, military, civilian, contractor. You represent the best this country has to offer, and I'm deeply appreciative of your service and your sacrifice. I'm drawn to people with the courage to stand up and fight for what they believe in, whether it's the best way to fight a BFM engagement, what the future of air power looks like, or how to best compete with China. When I reflect upon what I'll miss most, it's the shared commitment to common objectives, and I've been fortunate to find that from fighter squadrons to meetings in the Pentagon. I'm grateful to our neighborhood friends who welcomed my family and in the McLean community back in 2012. We've developed deep bonds with you all, and I look forward to spending more time with you in the future. Huge thanks to my hockey community as well, to my Nucks, whom I've played with every time I've been stationed in DC, dating back to 2007. Thanks for being here, fellas. And to my newer hockey community on the coaching side, for those families who trusted me with their kids the last few years, hockey truly is my sanity escape, and I'm looking forward to spending more time at the rink. Finally, and of course, I'm deeply thankful for my family, for their love and support all along this crazy journey. Starting with my parents, so we've heard my father's here today, but my mother and stepfather could not make it. Hopefully they're following along uh, on the live stream. Thanks to you all for convincing me that I could accomplish something in my life, especially helping me through those difficult teenage years when I didn't seem destined for much of anything. <laughs> Your example of hard work and public service clearly actually did sink in, and thanks for being there uh, for me, celebrating many life and career successes and convincing me to keep my chin up when things were hard. Carly, you're the most generous human being I know. You sacrificed a promising and far more lucrative career to follow me on this Air Force journey. You're a loving wife and an exceptional mother to these five beautiful kids, and you so positively impacted dozens more we fostered over the years. I know that I wouldn't be standing here today after this sort of a career without your love and support over the years. Thank you. S flowers, please. <laughs> you can. I love you, Will. You can give me mine later. <laughs> so for Nia, Jack, Serena, Lauren, and Lonnie, at the end of the day, you guys are the reason I served for so long. I wanted to do my part to ensure you could grow up and do anything you dreamed of doing. I'm so proud of each of you, and I hope this celebration helps you understand a little bit more about your dad, and I hope you're proud of me. So while I hope you're proud of me, you're also going to be disappointed that that whole conversation we had in the green room was actually true. We are not getting ready to embark on a big vacation. I know I ruined that decade or over a decade ago um, in a prior um, change of command speech. Uh, I do have gifts for you, and we will give those to you at home. <laughs> I'll let that sink in. Sorry, your disappointment is palpable. I get it. Uh, 
Naya, never imagined you being in the family business, but it's awesome to see you crushing it at Lockheed, working tough F-35 issues. You're such a strong, independent woman with a kind and generous heart. I'm excited to see where this life takes you. You can do anything you set your mind to, and I love you. Jack, we could hardly be more different, but that only makes me prouder of the man you're becoming. You've got artistic talent and appreciation that clearly did not come from me, but I just know we're gonna watch you on the big stage in New York someday. Can't wait to spend more time with you up at Ithaca this year. Yeah, you're just an amazing human being and I love you. Serena, I'm so grateful you came into our life. You're such a sweet young woman. Really enjoyed watching you learn and grow so much, especially over the last year. I know you'll figure out the pathway in life that's perfect for you, and I can assure you that you've got more of that figured out than I did when I was your age. I look forward to spending more time with you and Lauren in your senior years here. Lauren, you're the strongest person I know. Your spirit, drive, and ability to plow through any obstacle inspires me to be a stronger and better person. I'm so proud of how you've grown over the last few years, and I know your senior year will be filled with joy as you figure out what's next. I love you, and I'm proud of you. And then there's one. Lonnie, eight going on 28. You're the source of so much joy and love in the house. Such a huge personality combined with intense sweetness. You too can accomplish anything you want in this life. Don't ever forget that. I love you so much and I'm looking forward to way more snuggle and tickle time on the couch. Standing up here reflecting on my career has been surreal to say the least. While I'm proud of what, I'm what I've accomplished, what makes it all worthwhile is doing it with and alongside quality people. So again, thanks for making the time to celebrate with us. As my dear buddy Raisin says, I'm not retiring, I'm graduating. I'm excited about what comes next. And I'm looking forward to continuing to contribute, albeit in a different way. I hope you all brave the weather to join us this afternoon at the reception at 4.30, it's at 4.30, 16.30, 4.30, not immediately after, at the Crystal City Sports Pub. Before I let you go, I wanna leave you with one last quote, uh, quote from Adlai Stevenson, captured in a gift from our friends E.T. and Marianne Williams years ago. True patriotism is not manifested in short, frenzied bursts of emotion. It is the tranquil, steady dedication of a lifetime. I gave this career my all, and I'm thankful for all the opportunities I've had. For all of those of you who have served and for those of you still serving in whatever capacity, thank you for your patriotism and your devotion to this amazing country. The men and women of the United States Air Force are proud to have served with Major General Abba and assure him he will always be a respected member of the Air Force family. We wish him every success in his future endeavors. We invite everyone once again to attend the reception at Crystal City Sports Pub starting at 4.30 this afternoon. <laughs> Please rise for the playing of the Air Force song. This concludes today's ceremony. Please join General Holmes in congratulating Major General Abba and his family in the receiving line